Hi, I'm Craig Rayner. I'd like to thank AAPS for the wonderful opportunity to present today's prologue on the role of MIDD for COVID. Look, the biggest challenge when talking about model informed drug development methods is that everybody has valuable but often differing perspectives, preferences uh, or, or approaches that they would, they would generally apply in a given situation. Uh, we use different lexicon about what is a model. We go deep, we go technical, we get into debates about objective functions, but often miss the point that it is the beauty of modeling approaches is, is not necessarily the elegant math, rather it is the application to value creation. And today I'll provide a high level context to support some of the deeper discussions by my co-presenters in this session on MIDD and its application to COVID. Specifically, by the end of my presentation, I hope that there's a recognition that COVID is a complex disease. For pandemic pathogens, one must consider the additional lens of precision public health. And that there's an expansive array of MIDD approaches that, if applied appropriately, can contribute a lot of value in the world's response to emerging pandemics. I think few realised what we're really up against with developing countermeasures for COVID as it started to take hold earlier this year. Now, look, developing therapeutics in general is tough, and it's the reason uh, in the medical countermeasure space that we prefer to do it in uh, pandemic planning mode rather than in the middle of a crisis. So we've grappled uh, with operational challenges of executing trials uh, during a pandemic, uh, including also how to process some of the information overload some of the poor science permeating the preprint channels, tweets, uh, politics, and newspaper articles. But the response, I hate to say, it was sadly predictable. You know, well intentioned chaos, at least for the most part, is probably the best way I can describe the world's response to finding therapeutics that might be effective for COVID. More than 1,800 trials, heavily weighted to hospitalise patients. The majority of them are two arm studies, and the most common intervention has been hydroxychloroquine. So, if I take a snapshot from the 220 clinical trials for hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, as we did recently using the Codex trials database for COVID, you can see here that the odds ratios for death from this blended selection of 13 cohort studies and six RCTs, that overall there's no signal for benefit at reducing death using hydroxychloroquine in either PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis or treatment. And from the 21,342 patients that we used to construct that plot, depending upon what analog you actually lean on for per participant costs in the trials, it costs between 1.5 and $4.8 billion to answer that question whether or not hydroxychloroquine is effective. Now, for those working in pharma, imagine your career half-life if you presented to the development committee and said, look, all I need is $4 billion to tell you if hydroxychloroquine is likely to work against COVID. So another observation uh, is this concept of optimal dose, at least external to the industry, has been lost. The, the stubbornness around using an approved regimen from a completely unrelated indication for a repurposed treatment for COVID even in the face of compelling science that suggests that it's not going to be effective, is incredible to me. Of the more than 1,800 clinical trials conducted or in progress to date, it's really difficult to find studies that have dose regimen finding in design. Uh, the fact that every milligram above optimal is less for others, uh, that it's more supply and uh, more stress on the supply chain uh, and deployment. Uh, there's the potential for, for more adverse events, or that every milligram below optimal um, is the potential for ineffective treatment and resistance, is probably the most acute and visible example to me that highlights the tight interdependency between manufacturing and formulation science and clinical and quantitative pharmacology. So currently, optimal dose regimens for COVID will need to be deconvoluted from the existing trials 
And given that many of those are underpowered and they've included duplicative uh, regimens, non pullable endpoints, there's little signal of efficacy in, in, in many of them, I have little faith that this will be a convincing um, exercise. So right now, I feel that the weakest link in the global development response to COVID is an apparent skipping of the essential pieces to get the science right around the dosing regimen. Rushing straight to a, a blunt two-arm RCT without an appreciation of an effective dose. It's a, it's a false econ economy. We're seeing it already, as I've shown, with the volume of trials activity, the duplicity and the wasted efforts. We're seeing it with repurposed drugs that are being naively administered at doses that should not be studied in patients and are therefore putting patients at risk. But if there is a silver lining on this Groundhog Day, it's that it's, there is a difference this time as opposed to past pandemics. Uh, and, and the difference is, is the public visibility of these failings. This public visibility of these failings is going to lead to a call for a better response. If not now, for the next pandemic or the next disease X. And this presents a huge opportunity to present MIDD as a key enabler of any coordinated response for future pandemic pathogens. So it's very important that our MIDD successes today and our MIDD failures at creating value during this COVID crisis will be important exemplars for us to use in positioning MIDD in the future of responding to uh, future pandemics. So when I talk about MIDD, I like to paint an expansive picture. You know, anywhere quantitative models can be applied across the drug development um, continuum that add efficiency, remove costs and improve decision quality, that is add value, is what I like to consider um, as MIDD. Could be as simple as basic PK and PKPD models or even biostatistical models. It could be leveraging population methods, defining dosing in subpopulations to the more sophisticated platform approaches like PBPK, disease model or QSP approaches, to others like model-based meta-analyses where you're supporting critical comparative effectiveness investigations, phase three go, no goes, or emerging interdisciplinary modeling approaches where one can link PK, PKPD, epidemiology and health economics and really follow the patient journey. You know, that approach is very relevant for exploring the therapeutic impact on transmission dynamics. Um, one could also look at expanding the MIDD uh, consideration set to modeling approaches that are applied to precision patient care as well, you know, that some call virtual twins or the virtual twin approaches. You know, there, there are other aspects in our translational toolbox and model informed um, uh, development approaches can be very effective at applying those to supporting highly efficient clinical trial design as one example. But the fact is, if we get it right this time and we find ways where model-informed drug development approaches have been helpful, then we will earn the opportunity to improve future global responses to pandemics by showing uh, how MIDD can drive faster and higher quality decisions for COVID-19. Now, this slide's now dated, but illustrates an important point. The regulators in US and Europe are motivated and engaged partners in the application of MIDD practices. They, they make the most of the available information content to accelerate therapeutics for COVID. And this is really important because it's not just from the sponsor or the academic or the scientific side um, outside the regulatory environment, but the regulators are very um, uh, amenable and readily embracing of these approaches to improve decision making. And you're actually going to hear that from our FDA speaker a little bit later, just how engaged they've been in the hydroxychloroquine example. So let's do a little bit of a switch now to get a bit deeper with, um, uh, with, with COVID uh, and knowing what we're up against with SARS-CoV-2. So SARS-CoV-2 is a RNA virus. It attaches to the host cell via ACE2 and similar to other RNA viruses, hijacks the host cell for key parts of its replication. 
uh, and, and its budding and its release, and also uses some of its own viral enzymes in this process, including polymerases and proteases um, that are potential drug targets. Now, once SARS-CoV-2 infects a patient, uh, the bulk of patients exhibit uh, a viral response phase um, with uh, variable uh, symptoms, ranging from mild constitutional symptoms and cough and headache and fever. Some actually go on to progress to a pulmonary inflammation phase, requiring uh, uh, oxygen due to shortness of breath. And few of those uh, continue to uh, progress towards the systemic inflammatory response phase um, uh, with uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, cardiac failure and, and death. Now, the distinct phases of the disease are important to distinguish, as clinical trials findings from one part of the disease process are not directly transferable to another. Antivirals are most likely to be effective in that early viral phase, and immunomodulators are going to be of greater relevance in the stage where the host inflammatory response is ensuing. And as we wrote in the Lancet Global Health recently, this nuance is actually often forgotten and it's not appreciated, which is a real problem because the, the, the treatment perspectives and the endpoints evolve quite dramatically along this COVID disease course. For example, interventions successful in early disease that reduce viral shedding may provide significant public health benefits. So the treatment perspective is not purely focused on individual clinical outcome, whereas later in the course of the disease, this is much less the case. To expand on this a little, let's take a potential COVID antiviral. The greatest potential to establish impact and value will be early in the disease when it's a viral disease, matching the pharmacology with the pathophysiology. There are a myriad of clinical outcomes that can be examined, uh, diary cards, symptoms, uh, as well as reducing the proportion of patients continuing to, to worsen and uh, being hospitalised. Uh, and, and all of those kinds of endpoints are strong individual clinical outcome measurements and drivers. But if an antiviral can reduce duration of shedding, viral shedding, which is aligned with their primary pharmacology, it may reduce the probability of transmission and impact important policy and guidelines, such as reduced duration of quarantine and be positive levers in an overarching public health response to open up movement and travel. Now, this concept of competing use cases of public health versus individual and the value of MIDD approaches to help describe the deployment strategies of an antiviral under various pandemic scenarios has been described previously by Kamal and colleagues. In that, that specific situation, they performed interdisciplinary modelling study that linked PK, viral kinetics, PKPD, epidemiology models and health economic models together in a single quantitative framework. And they did this for oseltamivir against a range of theoretical pandemic influenza viruses of differing virulence and infectivity. The authors were able to then provide epidemiological outputs and associated costs through a payer or a societal lens for a variety of oseltamivir dose regimen intervention strategies for um, a, a range of emerging viral pathogens. So getting back to the COVID example, as only 15% of therapeutic intervention studies are examined in the early treatment space, there appears to be a significant opportunity to think differently and evaluate antivirals earlier in the disease course and expand our thinking from just the individual patient to public health benefits. Uh, Model-informed drug development methods will actually be critical and central to being able to make this link. Now, this slide comes from a lessons learned from prior pandemics webinar earlier this year. I'd hope to this point, I've made the case that the world's collective response to find therapeutics for COVID has been left wanting. Developing drugs in a pandemic is formidable and you need to, to, to consider a, a range of different audiences, public health versus 
uh, individual clinicians and, uh, and, and patients. And I hope that you will agree with me that if we can show the potential value of MIDD, we'll be able to ensure it can be a key enabler in the step change that we need in tackling COVID to now and also responding to future pandemics. So I'll now touch on a few specific COVID MIDD examples and some good learnings uh, at a high level of which a few of these specific ones, some of the later speakers will go through in, in a great deal of uh, further detail. So the first example I'd like to talk about is lopinavir ritonavir for COVID. So if we picture COVID-19 uh, peloton, uh, it's a race, we're trying to get to the finishing line, we're traveling along and we have various stages of this, this cycling race to actually get through. Uh, and what we're trying to do is hope not to become unstuck before we get to that uh, finishing line. So with lopinavir ritonavir, some early information suggested in vitro derived EC50s from Vero E6 cells were relevant. And even the WHO prioritized it as one of the critical therapeutics to evaluate in the solidarity trial. Uh, a New England Journal of Medicine paper then came out and showed no benefit in uh, severe illness. And this was later supported uh, quite recently by, by findings in the recovery trial. So for many of us who work in the influenza space, I don't think this was too surprising, given the fact that most of these patients received the drug um, more than 12 days after symptom onset. So our thoughts ran straight to the potential for early treatment and also getting high concentrations quickly to where the virus was likely to be. And as I've mentioned, there was still equipoise uh, in the early or that outpatient setting. So we used a population PK model, as well as some very sparse available data on lung penetration to gather some insights on the likelihood of efficacy of lopinavir, ritonavir uh, early in treatment. The current regimens we didn't think had any chance. Uh, we designed some pragmatic rationale to come up with a loading dose regimen. Uh, that would uh, get us a bit closer to achieve some faster achievement of effective concentrations within lung tissue. And given some additional clinical data that was coming out at that time, as well as some of this supportive clinical pharmacological rationale, we sought to put to rest whether lopinavir, ritonavir had antiviral activity against COVID. In fact, we are uh, well, well advanced uh, in our uh, together platform trial where we are examining lopinavir, ritonavir um, at impacting viral load in the most sensitive experiment in our belief, which is that very mild early onset disease. In our opinion, this is the first clinical experiment that should have really been done to examine the potential proof of concept for efficacy uh, for this antiviral and actually for um, all antivirals. So the next example is well known, and we will have significant more discussion about this with, with, uh, with some of our other speakers. So uh, like with lopinavir, ritonavir, there was some initial enthusiasm of hydroxychloroquine's pharmacological plausibility because of the sensitivity in these Vero E6 cells. Now these Vero E6 cells are a cell lineage originally isolated from kidney epithelial cells from the African green monkey. Now, with the passage of time, um, we've seen these convenient Vero E6 uh, cell lines, um, which, are, which are quite useful in a virology sense because they grow fickle virus due to a low interferon response. But unlike the human epithelial cell lines, they also lack an alternative pathway for SARS-CoV-2 uh, internalization. So it's a cell line which is particularly vulnerable um, for false positives. And hydroxychloroquine um, ends up hijacking one of the, the, the one functioning uh, element of that internalization, and thus really is seen as a, a cell line that, that had generated a false positive signal for efficacy for hydroxychloroquine. But at the time, it was considered to be an illustration of pharmacological plausibility. So compounding this, a, a paper that was published by Yao used a physiological-based PK model, and they concluded that lung concentrations with a loading dose regimen anticipated to be safe and effective 
would be effective for treatment and prophylaxis uh, for hydroxychloroquine. And this provided key rationale for conducting uh, a great many clinical trials, as, as you have seen. And we'll hear from later speakers on some of the controversies with this specific study and the translational approach. But suffice to say that it's clear that the nuances of both the virology and the pharmacology are missed when well-intentioned scientists from outside these respective fields don't seek the expert input in a cross-functional translational science environment. So the outcome I've already spoken about, the peloton has come to an abrupt stop uh, with at least the uh, endpoint of death, and this is again mixed studies, um, there is no signal. But even so, with the billions of dollars wasted, some continue to debate, to debate that uh, there remains equipoise for pre-exposure prophylaxis in that area, um, as uh, does the potential for impact on other endpoints, such as viral shedding in early disease. The next case I'd like to bring up from a MIDD perspective is one we're hoping will not be the next hydroxychloroquine, and that is of ivermectin. In this situation, researchers in Australia presented some in vitro data, and it's been referenced more than in, in 450 publications, has had an FDA warning, has been embroiled in that high profile surgosphere retraction story, and has seen a surge on veterinary products and statements from the Mectazan donation program about this not being a good idea. We responded straight after it was published um, and because it looked considerably worse than the hydroxychloroquine example in the same Vero uh, cell systems and concentrations for antiviral activity when we uh, examined it, uh, even with that setting, uh, were uh, apparently unachievable in lung tissue. So using PBPK modelling, we showed that even with a very high dose of ivermectin, which, is, which, which was greater than the label, 600 microgram, a kilogram uh, per dose daily for three days, even in that situation, the in vitro IC50s were still more than 21 fold higher than the highest anticipated lung tissue concentrations. Unless new evidence emerges that suggests clin clinically relevant concentrations with an appropriate safety, safety window can be achieved, which is not the case currently, clinical investigation should not be advocated or supported for this compound. Uh, science is littered with in vitro promise and clinical failure. This isn't new. And we should not be basing our um, decisions on progression to the clinic on, uh, based on the quotes like this from the spoof article from uh, Jean-Claude Duss. Uh, instead, the many uh, other examples of drugs that could be considered with better profiles should be evaluated prior to ivermectin. At this stage, it's apparent that there's unlikely to be any single drug that will be a silver bullet antiviral for repurposing against SARS-CoV-2. Now, this doesn't mean that there's no hope for repurposing. Rather, combining the best of the army we have offers some promise for efficacy. Now, this approach is not without precedent. In HIV, the first drugs, uh, uh, the first drugs to treat were in monotherapy, like with zidovudine. Very high doses were used. Um, and they provided just a modest effect. But now informed by pharmacology, we have highly active antiretroviral therapy, which has turned HIV management into a chronic disease. The same for HCV, where cure has been shown with combinations of directly acting antiviral compounds as well. So using a viral cell cycle model, uh, which was built from patient data, um, we sought to um, explore the impact of various parts of the viral cell cycle, dialing up and down key rate constants, either independently or in combination, uh, to see how we might think about combining potential or putative antivirals uh, for efficacy. And look, what we learned was that first, in all circumstances, one should treat as early as possible and focus on viral shedding as the primary endpoint. Secondly, in the absence of effective uh, antibody that, that might work on viral clearance um, on, on C, which we predict will be one of the most efficacious treatment regimens. So in the absence of that today, if you can actually build a backbone of treatment with uh, antivirals that impact Delta and Rho, 
So this are, these are the rate constants which reduce viral production or remove infected cells. Uh, then you should do that. You should do that as a priority. And then add additional mechanisms like inhibition of attachment to such a regimen. Now, generally combination studies start with um, preclinical evidence of effectiveness and then transition to monotherapy. And then you layer effective monotherapies on top of each other to ultimately build up a standard of care and a, and a, and a combine, combination standard of care. But to move quickly for combination repurposing, as we need to do so in the COVID environment, this current development paradigm will not work. It's just too slow. And the other aspect is that it may actually miss potential relevant cocktails that might otherwise be studied. So we suggested a different pathway um, be considered in the application of uh, combination assessments uh, in the COVID situation. And this following approach, we suggest that one can use a model-informed um, approach. So to use a viral cell cycle model to prioritise preclinical evaluations. Now, only then if in the preclinical environment that antagonism is demonstrated, would you look to then move down the traditional development pathway. And those preclinical evaluations would be conducted within you know, a number of cell lines. You can also leverage emerging clinical data. So leveraging model-based meta-analyses or enriched registries or uh, the evolving uh, RCT uh, trials to help continue the feedback loop of validation of these preclinical systems. So otherwise, if everything looks okay and antagonism isn't present, you can combine a, a effective uh, part, um, a range of partners uh, and do an adaptive design platform trial, which you do by subtraction to ultimately yield the most parsimonious combinations. If one can come up with a model informed rationale for the starting combination regimens and um, move towards a simpler regimen by subtraction, and you show that that initial regimen actually is effective, you will straight away have a recommendation to be able to provide efficacious dose regimens to patients to use and uh, continue to evaluate um, uh, on that simplification path. So this truly is a repurposing play. Uh, we think it's a promising uh, alternative approach to the way we generally do this in pharmaceutical development that's relevant to the COVID situation. We feel that probably the largest challenge though is actually a commercial one, is who will actually invest in combining um, uh, compounds that are already available and uh, step them back through such a learn and confirm paradigm. Who's likely to get the commercial return? Who's going to take the risk? Would off-patent generic companies invest in this kind of high cost innovative R&D? So from our perspective, Whilst promising, the biggest challenge here, even in the setting of COVID, is actually funding these kinds of approaches, and it, and it is is it, you know a challenging market failure. So the examples that you've heard begin to illustrate a whole range of ways that um, model informed drug development approaches can be used in a scaffold to help um, inform. Um, translational uh, activities for emerging viruses. So firstly, by developing quantitative systems pharmacology and disease models with specific inputs of the virus and the immunology, you can create an in silico backbone. You can then enhance that with wet lab information. So you could picture a COVID disease model with SARS-CoV-2 linking to cytokines and, and symptoms together then substituting SARS-CoV with another coronavirus or a disease X and dialing the inputs based on in vitro or in vivo findings. Next, candidate therapeutics using physiological-based PK platforms like SimSIP or others can have 
wet lab uh, information informing the physicochemical properties and DMPK properties that can enable simulating concentrations in any relevant tissue that's available within those uh, PBBK simulation frameworks. And this combined package of information can effectively feed the proof of hope stage. That is, do we believe that there's a chance that the concentrations may be relevant at the site where the virus is replicating? Or how would an anti-inflammatory compound arrest or perturb the, the SIRS or R's response? That then leads to the clinical pharmacology proof of concept and dose determining phase. That's where studies that are aligned with the signal detection and proof of pharmacology that overlay the pathophysiology. That's asking the right question about an antiviral or an anti-inflammatory or immunomodulator where you're likely to see that response efficiently as possible. And finally, using the emerging information from RCTs with model-based meta-analyses or targeted registries to continue to confirm or further inform decision-making. Now, whilst the prior slide's aspirational, for execution, as we saw with the hydroxychloroquine example, the devil is in the scientific detail and in the integrated execution. You can't be effective in translation if you have elegant pharmacology and translation there and you are translating information from the wrong cell line or animal model. Effective execution of the most elegant MIDD strategy ultimately comes down to an integrated team of subject matter experts, and this requires effective communication of MIDD and collaboration. And in order to facilitate the adoption of translational pharmacology principles and increase scientific rigor to conquer COVID with funding from the Gates Foundation, we've established the COVID pharmacology portal. Now, this pre-competitive website seeks to provide a platform to share knowledge, collaborate, and we invite others to join and to contribute. In this environment, we provide in silico tools to support clinical trials design, forums to discuss issues relevant to advancing therapeutics for COVID. So in conclusion, I hope from my prologue, I've given sufficient background to support the uh, following speakers to dive into the details. I want to highlight that COVID is a complex disease. Therapeutic interventions should consider the public health response rather than just the individual patient benefit. And that there's an expansive array of MIDD approaches that if applied appropriately, can contribute a lot of value in the world's response uh, to emerging pandemics. I'd like to acknowledge the significant contributions of many people who are listed here. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the COVID-19 Therapeutics Accelerator and the support from many of the collaborators in the COVID-19 Pharmacology uh, Resource Centre. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the rest of the uh, symposia and uh, the following speakers.